Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. What makes music? What is music? It's mysterious, it's inspiring, it can be sacred, and to a large extent, it's governed by maths. In many ways, it's the ideal subject for a Naked Reflections discussion because it contains religious, mystical, mathematical and social elements. Can it influence our behaviour? Here's David Greenberg at Cambridge University talking on the Naked Scientist podcast. We're trying to see if we were to play a piece of music, let's say Adele's Hello, and then play somebody else, maybe Rage Against the Machine, How will that actually affect the listener and will it prime certain personality traits? So if we were to play Joni Mitchell's Blue, would that make somebody more empathic than before when they listen to the song? And then another question is, how long will that change last? With me to discuss the mystery of music, uh, Dr. Marav Rosenfeld, who leads on the Living in Harmony research project here at the Wolf Institute, Daniela Padley, who is researching the interaction between Anglo-Jewish liturgical music and the Anglican tradition, and is music director of Kol Echad, a Cambridge choir. And David Perry, who may usually produce these podcasts, but actually is a producer of music for various radio programs, including Radio 3, David, Radio 4. Radio 2. Excellent. Well, welcome all. Marav, your research looks at the interaction of Jews, Christians and Muslims uh, in Syria, in Iraq, but particularly the musical traditions. So I suppose from that clip, I mean, does music affect behavior? Oh, that's an excellent question and very sensitive in our project because we are dealing uh, with a very sensitive uh, historical part of both countries, of Iraq and Syria. And I'll focus here on Iraq in particular because only recently we had a huge project in London where we interviewed 30 Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Iraqis, who left Iraq in different periods of their lives. The fantastic thing about Arabic music is that it created for them a new Baghdad in London where they revived their coexistence revived their Iraqishness in a fantastic way. So the place was not relevant. The music created everything for them to feel again at home. And in this sense, it it doesn't matter if you are Jew, Muslim, Christian. It doesn't matter if you are a doctor, a lawyer, or a researcher. It doesn't matter if you are young or old, if you are a man or a woman. The music glued everyone to this dream of the past. So, David, mu- music carries institutional memory. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it does. Um, also, I mean, on a more personal, more banal level, um, I've spent a lifetime listening to music and I haven't even got close to discovering why or how it affects me so deeply. But um, I was driving down the M6 the other day, forgive me, and someone on Radio 3 put on Votan's Farewell to Brunhilde, which I hadn't heard for a long time. Yeah. And I was so overcome by the emotion. It's a piece of music I love, but I hadn't heard it for a long time. I was so overcome. I had to literally drive into a um, refuge thing well, and yeah. stop and listen to it. And um, so... I don't know how it works or why it works, but for me it is just incredibly powerful. And also I think there's some interesting examples of what you're talking about where music specifically brings people together, like um, Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, designed to reconcile the Pontanima Choir that was sponsored by Mm -hmm. Wolf to bring Bosnians together and make music from the different traditions. So I think music's particularly good at... um, reconciliation in some way yeah and also music has also not so positive aspects for example if a dictator wants for example we know that Nasser in in Egypt uh, after 67 uh, when they, they they were 
defeated, 100% defeated. He asked Um Kalsum, who was the diva of Egypt and the entire Arabic world, to go from city to city and sing songs and to make people believe that they actually won the war. So music has also the power to create uh, an illusion of something or to gear people towards po negative things and not only positive ones. I find it really interesting thinking about sort of uniting people through music because the research that I'm doing is looking at the Victorian Anglo-Jewish community and them trying to discover their own musical identity which sort of spoke to their Jewishness but also their, their Britishness and they were partly trying to do that for themselves but also so that they could assimilate and integrate with sort of the, the wider British society. So they had to create a sound which non-Jewish British people would understand and appreciate at the same time. So it's it's a really interesting time in terms of thinking what's important to us as Jews and what's important to us as as British citizens and the the intricacies of, of what was going on at that time are really interesting, just sort of thinking, can we use an organ in synagogue worship, for instance, um, is this a, Christ a Christian instrument? Is this just an instrument that helps inspire devotion? Um, and there was so much toing and froing about what that really meant. What about musical composition, Danielle? Was that affected by that appropriation, if you like? It was. I think there was a lot of new uh, music composed for the synagogue at this time, and it was written almost like church hymn styles. Um, there were some people uh, in synagogues where they still had a chazan or a cantor where they, they tried to fuse it a bit more. So you still had a, a soloist with a, a choir, um, but the sound was much more cruel than it had been. Um, and there was also this interesting fusion between um, what were sort of referred to as ancient melodies with western victorian choral harmonies so you get this strange kind of combination which to our ears works because that's what we've then heard for the last 150 years or so um but i'd be interested to know what it felt like at the time both to the the jewish community but also to other british people who heard it and you know were they thinking oh actually this just sounds like church music or all oh, this is a bit weird because we can tell that these are ancient jewish songs but they've been westernized it's it's interesting I'm very interested in, in the idea of, um, which I don't know much about, I must confess, that the, the different scales, the different sort of harmonies in different musics. I mean, we take for granted in the West the the octave system and the eight yeah. notes and all that. But Arabic music is completely different, isn't it, Mar Marav? Yes, it is. I mean, there are quarters of, tr of tones and three quarters of tones, but it's very interesting to, to mention the fact that Arabic music is um, documented in rabbinic writing as early as the 5th and 6th century. So um, um, there was a discussion uh, of where music is allowed or not, and there were two prohibitions about that. The first one was that uh, music can create a sense of you know, a person can lose his mind or his uh, control when he listens to music, particularly with wine. So there are all sorts of limitations of how you can listen to music, Arabic music. That was the music that was um, discussed. And then we had a second prohibition after the, se uh, the second temple was the, uh uh, was destroyed, then the rabbis decided that in, as an act of mourning for the, for the temple, the destroyed temple, we are, we are not allowed to sing anymore. And then in the 10th century, Saadia Gaon, who was the head of the, one of the largest uh, rabbinic um, ac academies in Baghdad, Sura, said that um, our brothers, the Muslims, uh, praise the God with music and it's wonderful and, and they enjoy it. So little by little, with his permission, we see more and more musical genres which are a mix of Hebrew religious text with ideas taken from Islamic sources, um, aesthetics of the poetry also taken from Islamic sources, but the music was completely, entirely Arabic, to the extent that now we are 1,000 years later, and you can hear a, a melody that is recited in Jewish, uh, Arab Jewish synagogues with a maqam, 
the, this is the Arabic scale, and you can hear the same melody with Quranic reciter in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, or in Syria. Daniel, do you think there's something, an echo there in the Christian um, and the Jewish interaction? We've heard Morav talk about the Jewish and the Muslim interaction on the, uh, on the score, as it were. Does that echo with what you found in terms of the, the West rather than the Arab world? Uh, well, the thing that struck me when you were talking was um, there's a piece uh, which is an ancient Jewish melody. Um, we usually sing it to the text of Yigdal, um, which since the 17th century has been used also as a hymn tune um, with the text of the God of Abraham pl- praise. And it's it's said that the man who, who wrote the English text of that, a man called Thomas Olivers, took that from having heard a cantor singing it in a synagogue. So this is um, a man called Maya Leone, who was one of the greatest of 17th century uh, cantors. I think this interaction between these different cultures and the different religions is absolutely vital to understanding the power of music. Because as David said, as he trundling down the M6 and had to pull off, well, I've had to pull off for other reasons than listening to uh, Radio 3. But there's something that touches the soul. There's something sacred about music. It moves one in such a profound way. I mean, how? I'd like to know the um, uh, research, you know, the brain research on how me- I'm sure people are looking We're at We're asking our friends yeah. at the Naked Scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, <clears throat> we use um, a sort of loose phrase, don't we, touched by God. You hear some um, mm. wonderful music and, and you use it as a sort of loose metaphor. Um, but the, uh, it's always fascinated me that um, we know a lot about um, Mozart's schedule when he was at the height of his powers. And people talk about Mozart being touched by God, okay? Um, So he wrote to his wife, Constanza, about what he was doing. We have all the opening dates of his great operas. He was trundling around Europe very uncomfortably, facing brutal deadlines, Yeah. right? And he produced these extraordinary... If you look at the manuscripts, they're almost faultless. There's hardly any corrections... They're fully developed. Um, And a German writer, Wolfgang Hildesheimer, did a very interesting bit of research. He hired a very skilled music copyist uh, to copy Mozart's scores in the time that he, Hildesheimer, thought Mozart had to complete them. Mm. And the copyist fell short. Right yeah. now, it's it's not definitive because he, we don't quite know how much that. But it's very persuasive to me that something extraordinary was going on. Now, was, is that the hand of God? I don't. I don't know. I'd like to go back to your question, Ed. And uh, from my experience, when I ask people why music make you feel so good, many of them reply that it brings them back to their childhood when they felt safe and secure when they felt love, and we, when they weren't aware of all the troubles and problems in the world. So the music created for them a safe space of love, of secure. Uh, and I think music has this power, because you can think of your own experience. I can say from my own experience that sometimes when I feel sad and, and tired, it, all it takes is to hear a few phrase, musical phrases of a, a melody that I like, and all of a sudden the, the world looks fantastically well. So there is a certain kind of power that music creates, a sort of illusion to make you feel better. These people cannot go back to their childhood, but the music evokes in them memories of being safe and, and protected. You're listening to Naked Reflections, and my guests this week are Dr. Morav Rosenfeld, Danielle Padley and David Perry. And we're talking about music. Here's a clip from Duncan Astle from The Naked Scientist. There have been some really nice studies uh, where scientists have followed children over time, 
or where they randomly allocated children to different types of musical training. And they've shown that it can have some positive benefits for fine motor skills or listening skills. Um, and some studies have used brain imaging to show that um, brain areas associated with those skills uh, show changes and that certain um, connective pathways in the brain, so for example, the, the connections between the two halves of the brain, are boosted by musical training. So there is more compelling evidence that learning to play a musical instrument could have positive benefits uh, for children's cognition. David? Yeah, it's interesting to me because um, my oldest son was, was very slow at reading. He couldn't get, for some reason, he couldn't get alphabets and he didn't couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and we took him off to a music teacher who um, gave him a recorder and showed him some scales and so on. And he very quickly understood the score, the, the notes. And that he then immediately was able to interpret words and letters in a way he couldn't. So I think, Definitely. cognitively speaking, music can be extremely fruitful and interesting in that way. Marav. Um, yeah, music can also uh, develop all sorts of social skills with children. And um, a few years ago in Israel, we had a project. We took a five-year-old children, Jews and Muslims from Tel Aviv and Jaffa, and we, we um, created all sorts of games together, but with music, a lot of games with music. And through the music, we showed the children the similarities between them. And I, at the beginning, they were very shy and they didn't want to speak with one another because they didn't even sh share the same uh, language. But it took them, I don't know, less than half an hour. Then they start playing with one another and felt very comfortable and very safe to collaborate, although they don't understand the language. But the music was very similar and familiar for them. And this created the bond between them. Just thinking about how children develop musically, obviously, I've got a 20-month-old son, and as a musician, I'm there trying to sort of encourage him to sing and appreciate music and sort of playing, you know, classical pieces over breakfast and things like that. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how how he develops musically. Um, he And he already loves music. He dances along to, to things on the radio, or, you know, whatever style of music it is. So this question of listening skills, Danielle, I want to pick your brains now as a conductor um, rather than a musicologist. When you're a conductor, you have to listen so carefully. What's the challenge? I think there are multiple challenges, not just for the conductor, but for the choir as well. Um, the, the conductor obviously has to listen to the choir, make sure that everyone's singing the right notes, that the sound blends if that's the the sound that you're trying to get but then the choir also have to listen to each other um it's very hard when you've got a choir of people who will want to be soloists um you need people who are going to cooperate and really pay attention not just to the technical things like right we all need to come off at the same time we all need to breathe together but also just thinking about the sentiment that's being expressed in the piece of music and I've conducted performances where it's just worked and we don't really know how I don't know whether it's the setting um you know being in a particularly imposing or beautiful building or having a very full audience and feeling the pressure of that or whatever it is but everyone in the choir just feels that magic all together and, and there are other times where you know whether it's a, a lapse of concentration or, or something happens which distracts people or, or it's just having a bad day but it Sometimes it, you can try as hard as you can and it just won't happen in the same way. Um, I can attest to, um, to that because I filmed Danielle conducting the uh, choir a little while ago. Um, th th there's another aspect to conducting which has always fascinated me, which is this sort of invisible power of the conductor. It, it's part of this mystery of music again. Um, <clears throat> there's a story about, um, I'm sorry to say, Herbert von Karajan rehearsing something. And he wanted to hear what a quiet passage sounded like at the back of the hall. So he motioned to his assistant and said, could you carry on? I want to go and see what this sounds like at the back. But by the time he'd walked to the back of the hall, the, the, the sound of the orchestra had changed 
completely. Now, now that's very sort of difficult to explain. And I've, I've heard Pierre Boulez talking about that. And he says he doesn't understand what, the, what a conductor does, but it's very difficult intellectually to describe it. But it seems to be almost like an instantaneous a mysterious link. But it also epitomizes much of the work that we do in the sense of having multiple interpretations, that you can have different interpretations of the same text, for example. You can listen to the same music from different places and hear different things. Yeah, so it means that the context is very important. And in this uh, uniting between context and listening, there's a very interesting phenomenon in Arabic music we have a composer that composed a melody, but he creates only the structure of the melody. This melody is taken by a performer, and the performer performs it in a musical event. He starts with a few two phrases. He looks at his audience. If they are shouting and screaming, he knows that in the right way. If they are not enthusiastic enough, he would rephrase it and start all over again. And in this way, you have two parts of people who are listening to the music, the performer and the audience. And between them, they create a static dialogue, which is called in Arabic, tarab, in which each they, they, they um, give each other a feedback of the music that, they, that is playing, that is performing. And through this, they create a very intense emotional uh, atmosphere. No, it's a bit like jazz music. You, you never hear the same thing twice. It's based on improvisation, and, and um, it's always fresh. It's an active dialogue, yeah. You mentioned active dialogue, Marav, yeah. um, and David mentioned the Pontana Choir, um, and there the dialogue is, is one incredibly powerful dialogue because you have um, members of the orchestra singing the melodies of their enemy, so you have Bosnians singing Serb songs and Croats singing Bosnian music. And there's something incredibly powerful listening to that because the singing the song of my enemy is, 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 is an act of reconciliation. It's acknowledging the existence and the value of the other. Now, Danielle, it's one thing to sing the song of an enemy, but singing the song of another tradition and then appropriating that tradition is something that perhaps you can relate to in your work. We uh, just, so my choir, Kalakad, just did uh, a concert a few months ago where we sang the very famous um, Howard Goodall setting of Psalm 23, the one that's at the beginning of the Vicar of Dibley. Um, but I'd asked Howard Goodall if we could sing the original Hebrew psalm, so I, I set it set it to Hebrew text. And it was really interesting because obviously the, the music hasn't changed, but there's this sort of greater sense of heritage, I suppose, to it. Um, and we sang it at a concert, which was at the chapel at Michael House, um, to a largely non-Jewish audience, and they completely loved it. I think they they asked for it as an encore, I think because they they were familiar with the music, but to hear it in a different language had some kind of emotional a sort of extra, I suppose, to it. Yeah, th th there's a counter example of this, of, of something where music has been wickedly misused. Um, there's a Deutsche Grammophone recording of Bach's St. Matthew Passion made in 1942, um, which was conducted by Bruno Kittel. And the text has been hair-raisingly um, edited. So instead of saying we lift our eyes to Zion, they replace it with something like, we lift our eyes to God, and so on and so on. I discovered that I was doing a program about the history of the DG label, and I discovered this recording, and I played it to a, a Bach specialist um, at, the B, at the BBC third program, and she practically sort of went white. It was just such a shock to hear those transgressive uh, mistranslations. Mm -hmm. And that, that's an, I guess that's an example of um, just the misuse of, you know, yeah. horrible yeah. misuse there's of another, music. Yeah, there's another example, if I may uh, 
talk about it. It was in Iraq after 1951 when the Jews left Iraq. There was a process of erasing any contribution to music that Jews have ever uh, uh, gave in Iraq. But the thing was that 50 years before the Jews left, they were the most important uh, artistic uh, musicians at that time. So particularly after Saddam, he systematically erased their names from the songs that they composed. So the young generation was born into these songs, but they didn't know that Jews were actually responsible for that. And then after the internet was allowed in 2003, after the invasion to Iraq, they listened to the music and they said, oh, there are another Iraqis who know their so our songs. How come they are in Israel? Oh, they sing the same songs in the same expression and the same melody. Who are they? How come they know these songs? And little by little, they discovered that, this, that the composers are Jews. But it, it still begs the question of the appropriation of music as, as a negative. I mean, I think it's really important to hear what, what David said, um, that music can be used to abuse, um, to take over in an imperial, colonial, offensive way, not just to recognize what's shared in common, not just to facilitate the, the positive encounter. And I, I don't mean to, to bring it all back down to the, to, to the negative, but I do think we need to be honest about that. So often you hear music uh, in the background of a film and it's the bad guy who's about to commit some yeah. heinous crime. Um, so music not only has the power to be touched by God, but the power to be touched by the devil, actually. I think I, I did um, a bit of research into this uh, as a master's student um, where I looked into uh, musical stereotypes and how different voices can almost be taken as stereotypes. So thinking about in operas, um, the, the, he the heroine is always the soprano, the hero is always the tenor, and it's the baritones and the altos, you know, the darker voices who are generally the, the sort of either the kind of evil characters or usually the best friend, <laughs> so the, the sort of side characters or the evil characters. Um, and I think that's been something that I've noticed even into going things like, into things like Disney films. You know, these things have become so ingrained that they've, they've just stayed in our understanding of how music is used. Yeah, it's very also very interesting to uh, note that this connection between the shaitan in Arabic or the Satan and music is very strong in Jewish and Islamic uh, religious writings uh, to the extent that in Islam you don't associate music to Quranic recitation. The Quranic recitation is perceived as the exact intonation in which the prophet received his revelation from uh, the angel Gabriel in Judaism, because there was a huge fear of Satan. There were, were all sorts of limitations at the beginning. If you want to sing, you have to sing only songs which prayers the Lord. You are not allowed to drink wine. You are not allowed to go to Batei Marzeh, pubs, for example. So everything needs to be under control because the music by itself has a powerful uh, um, way of actually uh, associate you to bad things so you have to be under control there's um uh in the sort of 17th century when um uh you have people writing uh fugue and counterpoint and people like bach sort of really prominently writing um, music for the church one of the rules was that they must the never cement, yes. uh, use um the augmented fourth which yeah. is sort of if you could have polar opposites in, in scales, that's sort of as far as you can get between your keynote and um, sort of this kind of, not centre note, but almost the, the sort of antithesis of your, of your keynote. Um, and it was forbidden in, in music of the time because it was, it was called the devil in music. Yeah. You weren't allowed to use this augmented force. Yeah. And blues, of course, blues was called the devil's music in the deep south of America, yeah. which is yeah, um, exactly. because they spoke of dark things and... Yeah tough times well I think we've reached the end of this podcast thanks to my guests Dr. Marav Rosenswald Danielle Padley and David Perry and thanks to you for listening if you'd like to get in touch with any comments thoughts feedback or reflections of your own you could email reflections at nakedscientist.com in the meantime you can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientist.com slash reflections. Do join us next time 